Welcome to another edition of Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237. With us once again, Governor Patterson, the 55th Governor of New York State. Welcome back to Reaching Out. Glad to have you back. You know, when you get invited back, you must have done something right. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. We're very happy to have you. So we get right into our questions. The role of the New York State Lieutenant Governor has been traditionally viewed as mostly ceremonial, but you in fact know that that wasn't the case. How did that image change since you and Governor Hochul became governors after dramatic resignations? So I was uh, very lucky, Greg, when I was Lieutenant Governor, I was able to negotiate a better package because I was the minority leader of the New York State Senate. And, I, and in 2004, we beat the other party, the Republicans, four times. And we were now within two seats of taking the majority, which inevitably we did. So when Governor Spitzer asked me to run for Lieutenant Governor, I said to him, you know, all Lieutenant Do Governor does is carry the governor's coat. So why don't we just, you know, work together, I don't think that I need to be Lieutenant Governor. So we negotiated, negotiated, and he got me to agree that I would direct, you know, I wasn't going to run it, but I would direct our policies on minority and women-owned businesses, getting them more contracts, because we had a woeful record in the state, energy policy, um, stem cell research, uh, domestic violence prevention, and arts and culture. And so I agreed to that. And then we made one other deal, which don't fall over when you hear this, Greg. We both agreed that we thought the next president of the United States in 2008 would be Hillary Clinton. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and therefore, somebody had to fill Hillary's seat. And Spitzer said to me, stay out of trouble and it's yours. <laughs> okay. All right. The only thing he forgot was to take his own advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's the first time I'm hearing this. So uh, so I was able to do more, but I will say, yes, but, but I, I, I've got to say that um, I was able to do more, but the governor's staff, you know, they treat lieutenant governors pretty badly. So when I became, became governor and I needed a lieutenant governor because the Senate had an equal number of Democrats and Republicans, and I wanted to break the tie. And I appointed Richard Ravitch, my lieutenant governor. I gave him a pretty good workload uh, while I was there. And uh, Kathy Hochul, uh, when she became governor <clears throat> under another resignation, she wanted to give her lieutenant governor a, a major role. Now, the lieutenant governor she picked had a myriad of issues around him and and unfortunately he had to resign uh, but uh, uh, but the congressman who has replaced him uh, I think will be uh, very good and will be very active and boy when you listen to him speak he sounds like the president so I, I'm looking forward to, to uh, a good uh, activity from the new lieutenant governor okay uh, we're going to invite him on uh, reaching out because I'm, I'm interested to hear him speak so uh, you you answered the question I was going to ask. Who was your lieutenant governor? Because that's that's like the twenty four thousand dollar question. But you answered. Yeah, my lieutenant Ravitch. governor was was Richard Ravitch, and I chose him under the with the understanding that he would only be lieutenant governor until uh, the end of two thousand ten, and I did it that way because I was trying to win a court case because the Republicans sued me saying I didn't have the uh, authority to appoint a lieutenant governor and the New York State Court of Appeals upheld my decision. So I did have the authority and that's why the, uh, there was no dispute at all about uh, Governor Hochul appointing now two lieutenant governors. She has that authority. Yes. So I was glad we were able to get that cleared up. But you know uh, what I think, Greg? Yes. If, Tell me. if you really want to become governor, the way to become governor is run for lieutenant governor. Just hang around. Something will happen. Well, you know, if, if you're lucky or unlucky, because I remember, God bless his soul, the advice your father gave you, 
and because your father was one of my mentors also, and he said, um, say a prayer for the governor, Governor Spitzer, to you, right? And they said, say a prayer for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. He, yeah. He, uh, I had called him when they told me that Spitzer was resigning. And I and he said, "What have you done so far?" I said, "I said a prayer for the Spitzer family." He said, but "Get back down on your knees and say a prayer for yourself." <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh! Yes, I remember you saying that. I remember your father saying that too. Uh, will the selection of um, Antonio Delgado as Lieutenant Governor help Governor Hochul? I think it will. I think theoretically, since the majority of the Democratic primary vote is in the city, that she, you know, in, 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 if she could have anything she wanted, would have had a dynamic citywide African-American name or Hispanic name would definitely have helped her. But I got to say, this guy is so good. I mean, he speaks beautifully and he makes sense when he's speaking. Uh, I, I can't think of the last person that came uh, around that, that he, he reminds me of, but I think that um, he's taking a chance because they link the lieutenant governor and governor after the primary, they run together the same way president and vice president do in the general election. So he's banking on Hochul uh, winning the general election. That's why he signed on to be lieutenant governor. But I think that um, he's a tremendous talent. And even if people don't know him in these last four weeks before the uh, primary election, every place he goes, they are going to be impressed. Now, I, I have to ask this question. How will the high visibility increasing crime especially gun violence, influenced the gubernatorial election? Well, I think that Mayor Adams and Governor Hochul have been very direct and have talked about crime a lot. I do feel that a lot of other elected Democrats are not really addressing the issue and it's gonna hurt our party because crime hits you, whether you are liberal or conservative, whether you are old or young, whether you're black or white, uh, whether you're wealthy or uh, on social services, the crime in New York has not spiraled to some of the numbers that it did back in the uh, late eighties. But the difference is that that crime was the crack epidemic and there were certain centers in the city, 144th Street and Broadway was the one in my district at the time when I was in the state Senate, and they were arresting 200 people a month on that one corner. So you, you may have feared the crime statistics, but you didn't fear moving around as long as you stayed away from these places. Now you can get act at 61st Street and Park Avenue. Uh, uh, people got shot in a, in a, a upscale restaurant right in that area a few months ago. Um, and uh, a 11 month old uh, boy was hit in the head with a bullet back in Brooklyn a couple of months ago. Uh, and a 11 year old girl was killed last week in the, in the Bronx by two people riding on a moped who were apparently shooting at someone else. So the randomness, uh, a murder in the subway uh, where it was clear that the individual who was shot was unknown to the shooter. Uh, you have to talk to people. You have to listen to their concerns, and you can't understate the uptick in crime. I'm, the mayor and the governor are doing the right thing, but we're going to need more people to do uh, some things as well. And sometimes when you have emergency situations, you take emergency action. In other words, you might empower law enforcement a little more than you would in uh, different periods because law enforcement has at times excessively enforced the law. And we've seen the terrible uh, situations that result in that case. But 
for the overwhelming number of people who are there, I think they would understand that the added power, uh, a more tactical uh, police, more undercover police, the, the reason it can be helpful right now is because the crime wave is um, not only threatening, but it is frightening. And I think that uh, we as a party have to not allow the Republican Party to be viewed as the only crime fighters. So what would be your advice? Who are the people, if, if you have the governor, you say doing the right thing and the mayor is doing the right thing, they need help. So what would be your advice? Who is Who are the people that are supposed to help and how do we get them to help? Well, I think it's a, it's unfortunate that they haven't gotten together and had a big uh, meeting about this kind of thing. I remember, uh, you know, when I was governor, I came down here and met with uh, the city council about some city issues. I've seen uh, mayors go up to Albany and sit with the assembly, sit with the Senate. Um, I know one time Mayor Bloomberg wanted to meet with the assembly about congestion pricing and they weren't for it. So they didn't allow the meeting to take place. And I thought that that was, uh, this was 13 years ago, but I'll, I'm telling you, Greg, I thought that that was um, uh, poor execution of uh, political advantage. They knew they could stop the legislation, but they didn't even allow him to come in and talk about it. I think at times like this, when so many people are violent, the people who wanna talk should be talked to. And I spent many a time meeting with people knowing that they probably had a 1% chance of changing my mind. But I met with them anyway, because that's what I thought the people sent me to Albany for. That's what I thought the uh, people um, who um, uh, I served deserved. Well, that, that was very um, magnanimous of you to do that and just point that out. And we've lost our way of decorum in this world of politics and everything's become mean-spirited where one side doesn't even want to listen to the other side. And that always goes uh, uh, goes to bad politics and, and just bad manners. It's just bad all the way around. You have well said. Uh, you're listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. With me, our very special guest once again is the 55th Governor of New York State, David Patterson. There are several hot button issues concerning New Yorkers, such as bail reform, mail control of public schools, the homeless crisis, the current increasing increase in testing positive for COVID violence. I mean, the COVID virus women abortion rights. I mean, there's so many issues that are popping up that I would never thought would happen in our lifetime. And nevertheless, all together. So let's just take, uh, let's take bail reform to start with. Well, here, I'm going to defend the legislature because the bail reform that they passed in 2019, though it did not inc include the right of uh, judges to assess the dangerousness of a defendant who is not guilty, but could commit another crime before a trial would begin, that legislature did not take that out of the law of New York State. This is the most misunderstood issue that we can talk about. That law was passed in 1972, and the sponsor was a Republican. Um, in other words, not to allow judges to assess the dangerousness of a defendant before setting bail for them. If you assess that the defendant is too dangerous to let back out on the streets, uh, then you remand them. But they got blamed for it. And I think because they got blamed for it, they have been kind of antagonistic but I think if they came back to the table and realized that 49 states is that opportunity, uh, that could go a long way toward um, making people feel safer. You don't want people, um, 
people have to be presumed innocent. They have to get bail. If they can't afford the bail, it's really not a big deal to let them out anyway, because under our presumption, they are innocent until proven guilty. And that can only happen at the trial. They don't show up at the trial. That's another charge against them. And they won't get bail for that. So I think that the work out. But I think if we could just reassess and uh, put our faith in judges, they would generally know when to let someone out and when not to. Yeah. And, and what do you say about uh, this, the instances we hear that someone comes to court with a gun, a gun charge, they're let out, and they come out and they shoot somebody? This has happened all too often. And not just one person, they came out again and shot another person. What do we, what do, we do? What do we say about mandatory gun sentencing for individuals who carry illegal firearms? Not legal firearms, illegal firearms. Well, I agree with that, Greg. But again, we have to remember that bail under the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is assuring the attendance of the defendant at trial. It does not pronounce guilt or innocence against the defendant, whether they get bail or uh -huh. not. I do think if someone is arrested with a firearm, that obviously the firearm should be confiscated. And then, uh, you know, the fact that they had the firearm illegally could be a basis for a determination that they may go get another gun. But generally speaking, I, I think it's, it's uh, uh, especially with the proliferation of guns, I think stronger sentencing for uh, illegal gun possession would also uh, buttress our fight against uh, so many illegal guns coming into the greater New York metropolitan area. Sure, I, 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 I heard your point. It was well taken. Presumption of innocence, bail, should uh, bail is there to assure the attendance in the trial and stronger sentencing for those who carry illegal firearms could and should be in place for deterrent of people going around carrying illegal firearms and shooting people and killing them and, and maiming them. So, I mean, there's a medium that you and I are talking. We, I mean, we, we I think we're doing a better job than the legislature because we and I actually <laughs> talking through solutions on both sides. Oh, and you have Greg, bail, I think we, and yet you, we could get you and me and three other, you know, common sense citizens together. We got this straightened out at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just it's just common sense. We, we, we're giving ground. We understand the myths of bail and we know the purpose of bail. We, we explain it, we're listening. And we also know the purposes of keeping our citizens safe. Uh, just the other day, there was a man who was targeted on the subway for no other reason, it was almost as if the guy was just walking back and forth saying, I'm going to shoot somebody on this subway car. Who is it going to be? Well, you're the unlucky person. I'm killing you. And that's what happened. Yeah. Right it, was the train. it was a 48 year old man with a family. Yeah. And the defendant had just decided he was going to uh, shoot someone randomly. And I think that's also something about this current crime wave. The criminals of the past, as I said, it was during a crack epidemic, they were stealing to get money to buy drugs. They were not necessarily uh, any more violent than the fact that they would perhaps use a weapon to intimidate someone and take their money or take their car or something like that. Now you have this situation where for absolutely no reason, somebody comes out with a weapon. And we had this a couple of months, uh, uh, a month ago, somebody came out with a weapon and started um, shooting up the subway in Brooklyn. And the, the miracle, if there's one time that I think uh, New York City has been the beneficiary of a miracle, none of the people that got shot died and the um, perpetrator, perpetrator was apprehended. You, you're right. And uh, the individual who killed that 48-year-old man, I'm sorry, his name escapes me, and forgive me, uh, there was no crime committed other than killing him. He didn't want money, he didn't want anything, he just wanted to kill him. And uh, uh, I, 
I, I don't know what to say. There was no ask there. There was no demand. So, I mean, if that's what we, I don't like your face, so I'm, I'm going to kill you. Is that what we become now? You know, I was walking down the street today uh, on Adam Clayton Bell Boulevard, which is uh, where my office is. And I heard this person yelling at a, um, I guess it was an Uber driver or something, but the person was on a bike. And my first instinct was to hightail it out of there. So we all are yeah. have a heightened anxiety about yeah. this problem. Yeah. And um, whatever the issue was between them, it apparently got resolved without any violence. But, you know, just the drop of a hat is enough to upset New Yorkers because we experienced very low crime statistics from the end of the 1990s clear up to about two and a half years ago. And now we're... Uh, steadily moving toward where we were in the late 1980s. By the way, the late 1980s, that crime spree was always blamed on Mayor Dinkins. If people would please get their encyclopedias out and look it up or go online, Mayor Dinkins didn't take office until January 1st, 1990. And the crime rate dropped the last two years of his administration. I know you didn't ask me about that, but I just wanted to tell oh, you. Oh, no, no, you can take, take your liberties. You, you're on here. And you know, I, I realized that because I remember um, President Clinton at the time came up with the initiative and there was extra money that came into uh, New York because of the program that uh, Mayor David Dinkins had instituted. And then Mayor Giuliani came along and took all the credit for something that they took Dinkins all the credit for police officers who did not start serving until 1995 from the money that Mayor Dinkins uh, had uh, secured from Washington in 1992. And uh, the Mayor Giuliani took all the credit for it. And everybody says he's America's mayor and he the crime dropped when he was in New York, but it dropped in every other major city by the same percentages during that same time. So um, assuming that the former Mayor Giuliani's supporters um, can perform mathematics, it was an aging out of the drug abusers from the 60s and 70s that dropped the crime nationally during that particular time. So basically, whoever was the mayor would have been the beneficiary of that uh, drop in crime. Which goes and I'm not taking anything away from, you know, Mayor yeah. Giuliani did clean up Times Square. Sure. And he did uh, move, you know, some of those, you know, sex clubs and that kind of thing to Long Island City. Um, I think uh, there was uh, he and Bratton with the broken windows theory. I think there is a lot of good to the broken windows theory. He did do some good things, but the arrogance with which he acted as if no one else did anything to stop crime other than him and that the crime didn't start dropping until he became uh, America. At the time that he became mayor, those numbers are false. The numbers I gave are crime statistics that even Commissioner Kelly to this day has affirmed. Yeah, and, and Commissioner Kelly was the police commissioner then, and he came back a few years, uh, about a decade later, and became commissioner again. He is one of the police commissioners that served uh, two different mayors. Yeah, with um, uh, great success on both yes. occasions. Yes. So uh, we've covered a lot. I, I want to have you back. And, and having you back means keeping to your time schedule so that you say when Greg says, well, he's going to get me out by a certain time, he means it so I can come back and I can give him some more time. Well, this was was not your fault. Something came up that I've got to just, I owe you half an hour. So all oh, your people well, have you to do. you owe me half an hour, then we're going we're gonna to ask you when it comes back for another segment or part two or three or four, whatever we want to call it. But it's been a pleasure talking to you, seeing you on the computer. Uh, Governor, good luck in everything that you're doing. And we want to keep with your schedule. As we promised, we can get you out here on time. You've been listening to Reaching Out. Gregory, I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237, our very special guest, 
was the 55th governor of New York State, Governor David Patterson. Thank you once again for coming on Reaching Out, and we're going to invite you back. Thank you.